Uh, my talk today um, is a, um, a comparative uh, note. What I want to do is, having uh, studied the, um, the Armenian genocide extensively, uh, regionally, and some of the economic aspects of it, um, I've looked at the perpetrators, I've looked um, at some of the uh, collaborators, the organization of the genocide. What I'd like to do is to juxtapose some of the elements of the genocide, um, six of them, with other cases of mass violence. Because um, it's great that I'm standing next to or in front of the, uh, the banner of the NIOT. Of course, this institute uh, is um, an institute carrying out uh, well, research and, and, and university teaching on uh, the war, Holocaust, and also other genocides. And I held the portfolio of comparative genocide, and I think that um, the Armenian genocide has a lot to teach us about uh, other cases. So the, the, the empirical facts, the development of it, um, can, can contribute to theory quite a bit. And also the other way around. I think the Armenian genocide can also be better understood by looking at other cases of genocide in the, in the 20th century, 20, 21st century. And we can ask questions how these, um, these relate to each other. And I want to, oops, um, pose my central question. How, how do the various elements of the Armenian genocide relate to other cases? Now, some of the earlier studies in the, in the 1970s and 80s uh, tried to kowtow to the, to the Holocaust. Many, uh, some of the scholars, Rahagan Dadrian, for example, um, produced uh, an immense body of knowledge. But many of these studies, there were too much um, an attempt to liken or to, to find similarities and unique similarities between the Armenian Genocide and the Holocaust. And this was, of course, in an attempt to elevate uh, the Armenian case to the, the level, the moral and intellectual and political level of the Holocaust. And I think that's, well, that's admirable in itself. It is a comparative exercise, but I think we need to go much further than that. Now, the fundamental point here is that um, the Armenian Genocide was a multi-dimensional process of destruction, a policy of destruction, to quote Peter Longerich. Uh, what do I mean? Well, what, uh, I often get students um, who ask me, Dr. Inger, I'd like to do research on the Armenian massacre or I'd like to do research on the Armenian deportations. I think, yeah, okay, nice, but what about the genocide then? Because the genocide is a multidimensional process. It cannot be reduced to only one of the dimensions of, of this process. No, we're dealing with at least uh, six forms of, of violence, mass violence against civilians. And these, um, these were policies that geared into each other, that together worked to um, establish a, an intended, a coordinated, and a deliberate policy of extermination of, of civilians. So, and these are, as you can see on this list, uh, the killings of elites, uh, mass deportations of civilians, expropriation of the communities, uh, mass murder of those civilians, famine crime, so it's kind of intended organized famine, and, and finally, cultural genocide, which arguably has two dimensions, a human and a more material one. So what I'll do in the following 20 minutes is I'll walk, I'll walk you through these various dimensions. I'll talk about the Armenian experience, and I'll relate that or I'll juxtapose that with one other relevant case. Of course, there are many others, and we could talk about the comparative aspects for hours if not days, uh, but what I'll do is I'll take one example and I'll try to draw a, 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 common, um, a common thread or commonality. We'll also look at some differences. So the first, of course, important 24 April 1915 marks the day that um, many Armenian, several hundreds of Armenian intellectuals um, were arrested, uh, rounded up, in, starting in Istanbul and they were um, incarcerated and later deported into the Anatolian interior, and they were killed there. With very few exceptions, uh, none of them survived. And this policy of destruction of elites was then replicated in the various provinces in, in different ways, at different moments, but almost identically. So in Mush, for example, I mean intellectuals, the elites, uh, religious elites, 
cultural elites, political, very important political elites, economic uh, intelligentsia were rounded up, taken outside the city and shot in the back of the head or they were axed in different ways. Now, um, this is relatively well documented. There are a couple of really good memoirs like Yervant Odian, for example, or Aram Andonian. And I want to show you two examples here, two men who were both uh, who both became victims of this policy. On the left, we have Krikor Zohrab, who was a member of parliament and a lawyer and a very all-round intellectual. And on the right, we have the bishop of Malatya, Mikhail Khachadurian. And both of them, um, they fell victim to this policy. Now, what do they have in common? On the left, we have a secular intellectual. Um, we have an academic, really. And on the right, we have a conservative clergy, um, both uh, uh, arrested and killed. So the only thing they had in common was um, their ethnic identity. And so the targeting of the elites, the decapitation of the community, uh, occurred only based on ethnic criteria. And what's interesting is that there are some descriptions, for example, when these men are arrested in Istanbul, and they're put in the same room uh, at the police headquarters and they're kind of looking at each other, thinking, you know, what what are we doing here together? I'm I'm left wing. This guy's right wing. I don't like any of these people particularly. So even um, for these intellectuals themselves, the realization that this was based purely on their on their on their ethnic identity was uh, came quite late. Um, this is not unique in uh, in the history of modern genocide. I want to give an example from the genocide in Bangladesh, uh, in 1971 when the Pakistan, Pakistani army invaded, um, uh, invaded Bangladesh and um, using militias, particular militias, but also simply, simply army personnel, um, conducted a, a very brutal punishment um, and, and mass murder of civilians in that country. And they started very interestingly with the University of Dhaka, uh, whose campus they raided and uh, assassinated, uh, in some cases very publicly, Many of these these professors. So the, you know, some of these men are um, are became victim of this of this policy. So and I think this is interesting because in some cases we in some cases of genocide we see that the elites of the victim groups are taken and almost kind of elevated to organize the the self immolation the self destruction such as the Jewish councils during the Second World War. But here we have um, a rather similar process. The army went in. They took out the intellectual first. And before, before retreating, uh, they made sure that they mopped up la every last intellectual uh, in Dhaka, in Bangladesh in general. So very interesting similarities here. Now then, of course, the mass deportations. On the 23rd of May, 1915, there's a very clear decree written by Talat, signed by various uh, officials, and the document uh, is listed here that uh, authorized the mass deportation of all Armenian civilians to Derzor in the Syrian desert. Um, what we need is a lot more research on these deportations. How did it play out in different provinces? Uh, well, quite differently, actually, in some cases. Um, and secondly, what was their course? How did this develop? And what we see is we see concentration, of course. Armenians were concentrated in one region in the Syrian desert, but they were also dispersed. So um, in some of the areas of settlement, there, we, what we also see is kind of distribution to dilute their demographic presence. And some colleagues, such as Fuad Dindar or Tanar Akram, have argued that this was really the essence of the genocide, in that um, the, uh, the CUP, Talat Pasha especially, tried to bring the number of Armenians under the 5% uh, of, um, of the, the, the broader population of the Ottoman Empire. Now, there's a very vivid um, scholarship and fascinating uh, other cases of, of mass deportations. Um, one, of course, is well, the Soviet ethnic deportations. It was already briefly mentioned. Um, colleagues such as Pavel Polian, for example, have done some um, very interesting research on this. And if you, you know, from the vantage point of the Armenian genocide, if you look at some of this literature, and of course, the, I mean, Ron is very qualified to look at this because he's moved into both fields. But what I see here is that, of course, there are categorical deportations of, Ch of Chechens, for example, of Poles in and around the Second World War, before the Second World War and, and at the end of the Second World War. Uh, 
uh, of Crimean Tatars, for example. So they're categorical based on ethnic, ethnic criteria. And they're also penal. So they're internal penal transportation. People are taken from one region and then deported to a very inhospitable uh, region, in some case Siberia, in the case Kazakhstan. Inhospitable, much like the Syrian desert. And also penal, this is to punish this, um, this, this community, not necessarily to exterminate them. Another interesting comparison here is that the settlers, um, they received a special status. They were under a special regime, so they couldn't move uh, elsewhere in the, in, in, in the Soviet empire, but they were uh, under a particular regime, um, the, the Spetsbaselians, I think. Correct me if I'm, yeah. if I'm wrong. Um, I'll move on to the issue of uh, expropriation. Very important, of course. The community is decapitated. The uh, masses are deported. And what we see is three laws are being passed by the, by the CUP, in which the Armenians are collectively dispossessed. I think for the international law, it might be interesting to look at the content of these, um, of these laws. Um, they also, these laws also um, organized or structured the phases of this this expropriation. And what Talat Pasha did is the moment that it, these laws were passed, he devolved the implementation to the finance ministry. So he, he took the policy, he gave it to the finance ministry and said, figure it out. And the finance ministry then set up the abandoned property commissions, the Envali Metruke Commission letter, who then liquidated Armenian property and um, either to, um, um, gave much of it to the state or it went to settlers or it went to some uh, influential politicians in the area. What this has caused is a massive social mobility. If you were a poor, a poor Turkish peasant, you had one, uh, you had a small farm with a couple of cows, all of a sudden you could be uh, a massive landowner by usurping the property of your Armenian neighbor. Um, there are some parallels here. This is a bank not very far from where I live in Amsterdam the Lippmann Rosenthal Bank, which the Nazis during the war repurposed for the expropriation, dispossession of the, uh, the Dutch Jews. Now, what is interesting here is a very close registration. So um, the level of precision in the registration and coordination of the paperwork that's produced is really immense. So for historians, this is um, pretty, um, yeah, pretty interesting, I think. And secondly, we see a certain division between what this process meant for the top of the perpetrators to the, uh, the, um, the mid-level bureaucrats on, and all the way to the bottom. For ordinary folks, very often this process was about plunder and not about the ideology of creating a Turkish national um, economy. Now, the genocide, of course, wouldn't be... The, wouldn't be uh, complete, the picture of the genocide wouldn't be complete without the element of mass murder. Here's a picture of the special organization, the Teshkilato Masusa. These were paramilitaries who were tasked with massacring civilians. They were recruited, very interestingly, from several, con from several constituencies. For example, from uh, some Balkan refugees, several, some Kurdish tribes uh, uh, cooperated in them, but also they took them from some petty criminals. So. The, uh, the regime simply went into prisons, freed some prisoners, and then set them loose on the Armenians. And some very notorious people like Cherkes Ahmed, for example, Circassian, a couple other criminals were involved here. Now, for those who have seen, and for me this was a complete eye-opener, the documentary, The Act of Killing, uh, how many of you have seen this, this documentary? Yeah, for the, uh, for the rest who haven't seen it, uh, try, to, uh, try to watch it. I think it was absolutely beautiful. It's a depiction of the 1965 genocide in Indonesia in which you see petty thugs who were um, incorporated into the organization Pemuda Panchasila, which is a paramilitary organization supported by the Indonesian army tasked with the mass murder of communists or alleged communists in Indonesia. Now, when I saw this documentary, I thought, wow, these were the, the uh, special uh, organization operatives from 1915 because you see these people talking Petty thugs hanging out in front of the cinemas, selling drugs, you know, drinking alcohol, and basically helping themselves to um, anything and everything during the genocide. So the genocide kind of elevates and empowers these, these people. Um, and the government can also say, yeah, it wasn't us. 
It was these criminals, right? I and mean, what, what, what else can you say? You know, these criminals, of course, they will go out and kill civilians because that's what they've been doing for a living anyway. Um, fifth important dimension, famine crime. When the Arme as Armenians, of course, were deported, dispossessed, decapitated, they ended up in Deir Zor, in Syria. What we see there is, we need more research on it, but what we know so far is that there's very likely an ethnic hierarchy of food. So um, we tend to think that famines are a crime of omission. You know, the harvest failed, or you know, there's other <laughs> problems in infrastructure. But famines can also be crimes of commission. And um, there's some pretty good evidence that the Young Turk regime, or the CUP, organized the famine and basically expelled Armenians into a foodless sector, a zone in which Derzor, for example, they could not buy bread or they were denied access to food, whereas other Turkish officials or Arab tribesmen who lived in the same region were given, were given food. Again, I'm going to have to go to the Soviet Union, sorry, Ron. Um, the Soviet famines of 1933, 32-33 uh, in Ukraine especially, also in Kazakhstan, there's some very credible evidence that some territories were cordoned off by Stalin for ethnic punishment in which uh, countless numbers, the numbers are, are somewhat unclear to me, but there are some experts in the room. I won't embarrass myself by naming them. Um, but there's some pretty, pretty credible evidence of mass death as a result of this deliberate policy. Not extermination. It wasn't a, a policy to destroy Ukrainians for being Ukrainian, but of course the, um, the punishment policy was pretty, um, pretty clear here. I want to move on to cultural genocide. There are two elements here. One is the human element, the absorption of women and children into A, um, Muslim or Ottoman Turkish households, and B, children into orphanages. Um, Najwa, for example, she uh, talked about sexual violence uh, uh, yesterday. You can also see some of these women as the disappeared, desaparecidos, uh, as it's called in, uh, in Spanish. Of this, of this genocide. This was illegal according to Ottoman law. Um, and we also have, of course, later the issue of the hidden Armenians. Um, this is a famous book by Fethiye Çetin, who was one of the prominent persons who, who published this book. Uh, this was Ill illegitimate morally, but it also it was illegal according to Ottoman law to take people from one community and force them to become part of another one. Um, I wanted to show a little clip in which ISIS forcibly converts Yezidis, but I'll skip that because of time. But I can circulate the clip, you can find it on YouTube. A second element of cultural genocide is material destruction. And so this is the seventh element, the very kind of complex process, many sides to it. Uh, there's neglect. Some uh, churches were just left to rot or left to, um, to, to cave in, but there's also evidence of deliberate destruction, some pretty good evidence actually of documents in the 1920s and 30s, and also much later of the 3,000 churches, monasteries, and other, some within earshot of Akhtamar even. Um, now, of course, this, this, I think it lends itself to an interesting comparative analysis of um, the assaults by the Bosnian Serb army on, um, on Muslim heritage in Bosnia. Uh, there's the famous was burning and destruction of library, library and museum uh, in, in Sarajevo, but also of s smaller, older, but also newer mosques all across, all across Bosnia. And this, of course, if you look at this comparatively with the Armenian case, it's similar. I think it's also, also interesting because this comes from kind of, this is part of the, the Ottoman legacy. A, this uh, erases traces, uh, sorry, erasing traces of the victim community facilitates the denial. Because if you ra erase it, you can always say, look, they were never they were never even here. What are you talking about? There is no mosque here. The photos are a montage of uh, 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 stories like this. And B, also, those who have survived, they have nothing to return to because communities are built around symbols. They're built around ethnic markers, material ethnic markers, such as uh, mosques or churches. So they have nothing to return to. Now, my conclusion, for which I have 23 seconds, as I can see on, uh, on Richard's phone, uh, A, the Armenian genocide is a very complex process. It's not just a deportation or just a massacre. It's not even just a massacre and deportation. No, these other elements are just as important. And they, um, together, these many dimensions, they only together, they produce this intended process of destruction and annihilation. 
not just of physical, of physical Armenians of human beings, but actually of the entire identity. Secondly, some, you know, as you can see in some of these comparisons, there are some similarities with other forms of um, violence, other cases of genocide, but it requires much more uh, research. For example, the paramilitaries uh, slide that I showed you, we've had a uh, very lively communication with, uh, uh, with Alex Demirjian about paramilitarism uh, in the Yugoslav wars, and he promised me that one day he will give me all of his secret documents for the prosecution of some of these guys. Um, third point, my final point, uh, transmission. So um, Ron's opening talk mentioned that the Armenian genocide actually lowered the threshold for violence, or it expanded the political space for future political elites to commit violence against civilians. Yeah, so there's evidence that Hitler knew about the Armenian genocide, or there's evidence that, we don't know, maybe Stalin knew about the, 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 the Armenian genocide, and that they learned from each other, actually. They learned from previous cases, and they thought, uh, A, there's very likely to be impunity, and B, well, if you want to do it, this is how, this is how to go about it. I'm, I'm posing this as a question mark at the end because we don't know, but this is kind of a global history of transmission, and I think that um, yeah, it can, it can, it can um, um, produce some interesting discussions as well. Thank you.